first of all, huge, huge apologies that I can't be with you tonight. When we originally set this date many weeks ago, we had no idea uh, that Parliament was going to have some really important votes tonight. Very rarely happens on a Thursday. I'm afraid, sod's law, this Thursday it has. So I'm really sorry I can't be with you. There are some important votes here tonight on the budget. And I just feel it's hugely important to have a Green voice and a Green vote opposing that budget, because as you will know, George Osborne's program of austerity is being pushed through with this budget so that some of the poorest people are going to be hardest hit. And I want to be there to stand up for people who are literally being bulldozed by a government's policies that are attacking our welfare system, that are rolling back years of hard-fought campaigns to protect people when they're at their most vulnerable. And all of this is wrapped up in the rhetoric about austerity Britain about the idea that the best way to tackle the deficit is somehow to throw half a million public sector workers out of jobs with probably a knock-on effect in the private sector of a similar number too. We've seen a government that is prepared to slash things like educational maintenance allowance, trebling tuition fees, slashing support to the homeless, reducing housing benefit, cutting legal aid, the list goes on. And Greens, both nationally and locally, are completely opposed to this programme of austerity. And we believe that it's not only socially devastating, but it's economically illiterate. And the case I want to make tonight is that the way to tackle the deficit is for government to invest in jobs, not making more and more people unemployed, but rather putting government investment in jobs, keeping people in those jobs, so that their taxes then feed back into the revenue and so that you're not in a position then of not only making public sector workers unemployed, but then having to pay redundancies and all of the raft of benefits that goes alongside as, as well. That doesn't make economic sense, and it certainly doesn't make social sense either. And if we're calling on government to invest, then the case I want to make tonight is that the best place for government to put that investment is in the green economy. And of course, I would say that, wouldn't I? But I'm not saying it simply because we have a very big environmental crisis, although you might be forgiven for not thinking so because it's disappeared from our newspapers and our television screens. But I'm saying it as well because the best way to increase jobs as quickly as possible is precisely that investment in the green economy, in things like public transport, in energy efficiency, in renewable energies. That green economy is far more labour intensive than the fossil fuel economy that it replaces. And so it makes both economic and environmental sense to invest in that economy. So the case I want to make tonight is perhaps a slightly ambitious case to make against the grain of what you're hearing from all of the three mainstream politicians, and that is that yes, we have a deficit problem, but no, we are not broke. The key issue is who has the money, how is money created, how is it being spent? And as I make the case that austerity isn't working, I will also make this case that it is precisely in investing in protecting ourselves from the climate crisis that we face, that we have our best hope of, of solving both the environmental and the economic crisis. Now on that issue of is there any money, let me make a distinction between whether we have a deficit, which of course we do, and whether it really is the case that we have no money. Now everything that Chancellor George Osborne tells you would reiterate precisely the idea that there is no money there. The Daily Telegraph just a few weeks ago had a big title, it's official, we're broke, it proclaimed. And Daily Telegraph bloggers reported on an interview that Osborne had given to Sky News where he reportedly said, and I quote, the government has run out of money because all the money was spent in the good years. The money and the investment and the jobs need to come from the private sector. Well, as the Telegraph acidly pointed out, once upon a time the job of talking down the economy fell to the opposition. When your own Chancellor is doing it, then it really does suggest we're up a, a muddy creek without a paddle. Of course, in saying this, Osborne is simply reiterating what the previous Labour Treasury Minister, Liam Byrne, said when he famously left that note on David Law's desk, which read, there's no money left. And as we all know to our bitter experience, the response of the government to this is to slash public spending on an almost unprecedented scale. You know, I, I believe that as far as this government is concerned, this economic crisis is actually an opportunity for them. It's the opportunity that they've been waiting for to be able to take advantage from it in ideological terms, to push through the kinds of re re retrenchment of the state, the, the reduction of the state that they have been dying to do for decades. And here they find they have a perfect opportunity to do that. 
And it reminds me of nothing more than some kind of medieval bloodletting, this, this sense that austerity isn't working. If you think about what happened in medieval times, people used to apply those leeches and suck the blood out of bodies, and the more the body got ill, the more leeches they applied, and unsurprisingly, the body died. Well, I think, in a sense, we've got a similar state here with the economy, that the government is draining every last bit of resource out of our economy, and as unemployment goes higher, and, and as, as the pain gets worse, they simply pile on more of the same. The latest jobless figures at a 17-year high, 2.6 million people, 8.4% uh, of the population. And that figure is much higher if you uh, include the underemployed as well as the unemployed. We know that this is hitting youngest people, the youngest people, hardest of all, 22%. Women are being particularly hit, and in a sense they're having the effect of a, of a triple whammy, because first of all, they are disproportionately reflected as employees in the public sector, and so when the public sector is cut, it's women who are losing their jobs most. They're then affected because they tend to rely on public sector services more than men, to the extent that women are still most likely to be the ones in our society who are performing caring roles for children or, or elderly relatives. And then when, they, when those public services aren't there, it's women who have to step in. Uh, to provide those services for others. And so in a sense, as I say, it's a real triple whammy for women. As I say, of course we need to tackle the deficit, but the idea that you do it by throwing all of these people out of work is simply wrong. And if you have any doubt about that, then look at what's happened in Ireland. At the end of 2010, the Irish deficit was 17 billion euros. The Irish government responded by a massive programme of austerity, even more severe than what we're seeing in this country. But by a year later, the end of 2011, that deficit had risen to £25 billion. By the end of this year, it's predicted to be £35 billion, after even more austerity. And so this kind of analogy simply doesn't work. The government's been very um, clever at trying to persuade us that the economy nationally is just the same as a household economy. And just as it might make sense at a household level uh, to cut back spending at a time of economic difficulty in a household, so the government will tell us it makes sense to do that at a national level. But the truth is actually the opposite. It may be counterintuitive. It's what John Maynard Keynes called the paradox of thrift. But what happens if you have a whole government that suddenly stops spending? Is it that it freezes up the whole system? And it means that the resource to get out of the deficit simply isn't there. I think we could learn something from uh, Roosevelt in the United States in the 30s when they faced a huge recession. What he did then was to put huge amounts of investment in roads and bridges to get people back into work and get the US out of deficit. I'm not suggesting that we need huge amounts of roads and bridges, but what I do think we need is that massive investment in renewable energies, energy efficiency, the green economy, labour-intensive sectors that can help address the deficit that we're in. That's what Greens are arguing for at local level and national level. Let me tell, tell you about the Greens in Kirklees, who I visited recently. They brought an idea to the table which was about rolling out free insulation to 60,000 homes in Kirklees. And as a result of doing that, what they've found is that not only have their climate emissions gone down, but they've created over 120 jobs just in that scheme alone. And they've saved households around £150 on their energy bills every year. So those are the kinds of win-win-wins that we could be having. It's what Oxford Green Party is already doing on their local council, similar ideas. And that's what Oxford wants to do more of if you will vote for more Green councillors on May the 3rd. Now, I can almost feel you thinking, well, it's all very well her talking about investing in the economy, but where's this money going to come from? Well, let me give you a few suggestions. First of all, we've already seen the government introduce a, a, a massive programme, or through the banks introduce a massive programme of so-called quantitative easing. It's a mouthful of a word, actually. I met the guy who came up with the, uh, with the phrase um, a few weeks ago, and he was explaining that he was in Japan at the time, looking at the Japanese recession, and apparently quantitative easing means something um, better in Jap Japanese than it does in, in Britain. Essentially what it means is credit creation. And we've already seen in this country the banks create 325 billion so far, predicted to be 400 billion pounds by the end of this year. And that is essentially creating money out of nothing. You create money by writing a, an amount on, on a ledger. That's what creates it. Now, at the moment, that quantitative easing, credit creation, isn't working because it's not feeding through into the real economy. The banks are holding onto it or using it for speculative purposes. What we need to be doing is introducing green 
quantitative easing. In other words, putting that money into the green elements of our economy, but putting it directly into those small businesses that absolutely need it, not going via the banks. And so if we can make 325 billion when it suits us, we could be doing more of that. And the reason we don't normally do it is because there are risks of inflation. Right now, the far bigger risk is deflation. And so we could be using the tools of quantitative easing far more effectively and imaginatively. You know, we should be properly cracking down on tax evasion and tax avoidance. We are losing billions every year through these two things. Estimates vary, but Tax Research UK puts it at £70 billion lost in tax evasion and another £25 billion in tax avoidance. The government puts the figure of the two combined at around £35 billion. Well, even if you take the government's figure, that is a huge amount of money that is being literally leaked out of the economy. Now, I published a private member's bill last year to try to retrieve around £16 billion of that through two simple measures. A requirement on multinational companies to publish what tax they pay, requiring all companies to file accounts in the UK to include a statement on their turnover, their pre-tax profit, tax charge and actual tax paid for each country in which they operate without exception, and a requirement that banks should provide details on all accounts that they maintain for companies operating in the UK so that the revenue and customs house can chase those companies who aren't filing the returns that they're obliged to make. And that applies to around half a million companies a year. These are two incredibly simple measures that could absolutely raise around 16 billion. There's an e-petition on the government's website, so if any of you feel minded uh, after this talk tonight to go and sign up onto the e-petition, I would love you to do so. We've only got around 10,000 signatures at the moment and we need 100,000, so talk to your friends as well, that would be really helpful. Other ways of, of looking for money, Robin Hood tax, you know, you could raise £20 billion pounds for a Robin Hood tax, even if we only did that in the UK alone. And obviously if you were to do it EU-wide or globally, then the revenues could be very much higher. More progressive taxation overall. Why is it the case that the top 100 FTSE directors' salaries increased by fully 49% last year? An average of £2.7 million pounds a year each in their salary, and that's before you even get to all of their other bonuses and so forth. Trident, £100 billion pounds is going to be spent on renewing Trident over the next 30 years. You know, it's amazing that we can find money down the back of the sofa when governments need it for wars, for nuclear weapons, and yet somehow mysteriously we can't find it when it comes to protecting the poorest from the harshness of these government austerity measures, and we can't find it when it's literally a question of protecting our planet into the future. But the tragic reality is that all three of the main Westminster parties are still committed to yet more austerity. You know, I found it literally jaw-dropping when Labour's Ed Wall said just a couple of months ago, and I quote, we're going to have to keep all these cuts. You know, what is the point of a Labour Party if they are literally going to be replicating the same kind of cuts that we're seeing from this government? We need a radical alternative, and as I've said before, when you've got the Lib Dems now in, in bed with the Conservatives as well, frankly, the last thing we need is a third Tory party. And that's what Labour at the moment looks set to become. I've talked about the way in which these cuts are really hurting uh, the poorest, hardest. The way in which, for example, benefit caps and so forth are forcing families, for example, to have to leave their homes and trying to find somewhere cheaper to live. I'm seeing people come into my constituency surgeries in Brighton who are telling me really, really heart-rending stories about the impact these cuts are having. And if you kind of think, well, where's this leading us to into the future, then if you want a glimpse of what that future might look like, then unfortunately you need to look no further than what's happening in Greece. Uh, and I do think that what is happening there and our overall lack of, of response to it shows a, a, an alarming lack of imagination when you really hear some of the um, the, the, the facts and figures, and when you talk to people from Greece and hear what's happening there, a minimum wage slashed by 23%, nearly half of all young people unemployed, some workers haven't been paid for months, suicides are increasing, families literally handing kids to orphanages. I mean, this is just a monumental failure of economic policy and a monumental failure, I think, of solidarity uh, across the EU. So as well as that economic crisis that we're facing, we have a climate crisis. And I would argue that the climate crisis is a lot more intractable 
than the economic crisis and hugely more serious. You know, as a nation, if we had sufficient political will, we can share out our wealth more effectively, we can protect the weak if we choose to do that, we can reverse the harm done to the NHS, we can improve education for all. But, you know, we can't make it rain, we can't stop droughts, and we can't stop the sea from rising. Governments in Europe are aiming for 80% cuts in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, but that, we are already miles off that target, and that target in itself is, is far from being adequate. According to the Tyndall Centre, which is the foremost, or one of the foremost climate institutes in the UK, according to them, if we're to make cuts in an equitable way across the globe, then we in the industrialised countries need cuts in our greenhouse gas emissions in the order of 90% by 2030. That means that the climate crisis is hugely urgent. And it makes one reflect, really, that given that urgency, given the amount of evidence that we have that climate change is happening, why are we not acting more speedily to address it? And I put in mind of that wonderful film, The Age of Stupid, which I'm sure many of you will have seen. It features Pete Pothelswaite as the sole survivor of some kind of climate catastrophe. It's based in 2050. And basically, in 2050, he stands there looking back to real footage, TV footage, of droughts and, and climate disasters that are happening now around us. And he says, in words that still make the hairs go up on the back of my neck, why is it, knowing what we knew then, we didn't act when we still had time? And that, to me, is just about the most important question we could be asking. And in terms of trying to answer that question, it is because we are on this treadmill of thinking that we have to have more and more economic growth, more and more stuff. We're persuaded by advertising that that is the way to get happiness, even though we know that gross domestic product, GDP, has more than doubled in the last 30 years and we're not feeling any happier uh, as a result of it. And there's lots of excellent work that organisations like the New Economics Foundation have done that show that once you get a, a certain level of, of, of income and, and so that you can be comfortable and, and meet your, your needs. Beyond that, that acquisition of more and more stuff isn't making us any happier. To the contrary, in many ways, it's leading to a more unequal society, it's leading to uh, more social unrest, more mental health problems, more depression and so forth. And so in that paradox, if you like, I think there lies some cause for hope. Because if it's the case that the current economic system isn't even delivering in its own terms. In other words, not only is it economically bankrupt, as we see with the austerity programme around us, but also it's not even fulfilling what one would assume was it, its overall aim, which is to increase human well-being. Then maybe, in that insight, there lies some hope that we can find a way both to uh, address the economic crisis and the environmental crisis at the same time. It means a very radical and new approach to economic modelling. It means a different understanding, really, of, of what we really value in our societies. You know, not many people, when they're on their deathbed, look back on their life and think, my God, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. You know, they're far more likely to wish that they'd spent more time doing things that they enjoy doing, spending time with friends and family and so forth. And so there's something about the rat race that we've created, the kind of consumerist, turbo-consumerist kind of culture that we live in, that actually is fundamentally... Um, unhelpful to our own well-being, as well as being massively damaging to the environment. And I think the hope that the Green Party can bring to this debate is that we can demonstrate through our policies and through the programmes that we're pursuing that it is possible to live a life that is more fulfilling, that is a higher quality of life, that doesn't depend on more and more growth. And that's why the policies that we're putting forward at local election are so important. That investment in public transport, for example, investment in good, healthy local food, investment in renewable energies, energy efficiency, arguing for those things. Those things are the way in which we're going to make sure that it is indeed the case that we can afford environmental policies at a time when economic difficulties are high. Indeed, it is precisely at a time when we have economic difficulties that we must pursue those environmental policies as well. Thank you.